Welcome back, Vikings fans. You are tuned in to Bite Size Vikes right here on the Bite Size Sports Network. I'm your host, John Boyd. Uh, throughout the season, we'll have two episodes a week of Bite Size Vikes, uh, largely going to be game previews and game reviews, um, mostly dropping on Wednesdays and Fridays or Saturdays uh, for the preview episodes. This will be out on Saturday when you're listening or wa- listening to or watching this. Um, but thanks for joining me. We've got a lot to get to today. Uh, we're going to dive deep into the Buccaneers and how the Vikes match up, offense versus their defense. Uh, what can we do to affect Baker Mayfield? Uh, how can we move the ball against this Todd Bowles defense? And we'll get to a little bit of Vikings news as well coming up next. are um thanks again for tuning into bite size vikes you can check out the rest of our team podcast feeds on bite size nfl on spotify if you give that a follow um and also you'll see them on the youtube feed if you're watching here on youtube um you'll see uh, titans and steelers both have their bite size podcasts live uh at least this season preview uh i think we'll have a couple of game previews live uh by the time you see this as well um, and we've also got a, a ton of live shows going on on the channel uh, throughout the week, uh, Tuesday through Friday. We've got live shows uh, usually around 8 central. Uh, so tune into those. Give us a subscribe. Hit the like button. Comment your thoughts on this Vikings Bucks game that's upcoming. Uh, but we're going to get into all of that right after we get to a little bit of news here. So I'm sure most Vikings fans are familiar by now at uh, – it was signed yesterday, but uh, Josh Metellus has earned a contract extension. Um, two years, uh, max value of $13 million over those two years um, with six guaranteed. And I think this really just shows, you know, Brian Flores' opinion of Metellus. Uh, named a captain this year, special teams captain, um, drafted by the Vikes. This will be his fourth season with the team. Um, And he has really been a mainstay on special teams. And I think we're going to start to see him worked into the defense a little bit more Um, in the big nickel when they, when they get those three safety packages out, sounds like he'll be in the slot uh, playing a little bit of a hybrid role um, in the box as well. And he's just a really heady player, high IQ, uh, great leader, high character guy. And that's the type of player that can stick around on a team like this. It's, it's great to see him get his second contract with the Vikes. And, you know, similarly to like a KJ Osborne, um, these late round picks, they're really over that last couple of seasons, they're really targeting these high character guys who they know are going to work hard, might not be the most physically gifted, um, but but both of those guys, Metellus in particular, has worked his ass off to get to where he is right now, uh, spent some time in the practice squad, and now at 25 years old, getting his second contract with the team that drafted him. Uh, real testament to his work ethic, dedication, um, and and really his character. You, you know, you can tell how much they really value his presence, um, and, and, and I'm really excited to see how he's utilized on defense in particular. We've also heard some murmurs about the the JJ extension talks from all reports things are going well from the pressers from him and uh and the organization things seem to be going well it's I don't think there's going to be an impasse like we've seen with guys around the league like a Mike Evans things like that um it's just a matter of probably ironing out some some pretty minuscule details at this point. I, I think they're pretty close. Um, and it sounds like they want to have this contract signed by the home opener. 
on Sunday, and it may even be signed by the time you're listening to this. I'm recording this Friday night, and uh, it'll be out Saturday morning. We might hear that news overnight. It might be right around game time. Um, who knows? But I have I have no worries about that deal getting done. I have no worries about the cap implications of that deal. I said last uh, on last episode, just give him what he wants. Uh, and what he wants is probably synonymous with what he deserves and what he's earned in this league. Um, at his age, going into his second contract, the kind of production he's had so far in this league, it really it doesn't really matter how much you give him within reason. Like, it should be the highest paid receiver immediately. Um, the what that gap is really between him and that Tyreek Hill contract might be a little bit of the uh, of the negotiation that's going on there. But again, it's it's probably something like 32, 33 million a year. Probably something like a four year, 126, 128, 29 million dollar deal. Um, and guarantee, I mean, it, it's probably pretty significant guarantees as well. And no Vikings fan should be up in arms about that at all. Uh, I, I don't want to see any nitpicking with the uh, the amount, whether it's the average annual value or the cumulative value. Whatever it is, it's fine because it means JJ is still on the team. And you just you just don't let good players slip like this. So give them whatever it takes for him to be satisfied and bought in and have no concerns about his contract and just be able to focus on football, which it seems like he has been to this point. He's locked in. He's ready to contribute. He just wants to go out there and win and wants to play ball. So let's just get this off the back of his mind. For this week one game, I do expect a big day from Justin Jefferson, whether it's before those contract details are released or after. Either way, I, I do expect him to to have a pretty big day. And we can that's a that's a fine segue into how this Vikings offense stacks up against the Tampa Bay defense. So looking at this depth chart here. You're probably going to see a lot of Jamel Dean on Justin Jefferson. Um, that that's to be expected. They also have Carlton Davis, who is one of the better press man corners, or or uh, zone press corners in the league. Uh, big body, long arms, really stout. He's tough at the at the line of scrimmage. He's able to affect the the route stem and the release of receivers at a really high level. Uh, they did lose Sean Murphy Bunting uh, in the offseason, who was their slot corner. Uh, you might see a little bit of Antoine Winfield Jr. in the slot. Um, but otherwise, it's maybe maybe D. Delaney, at, at which point I think it's advantage Vikings, regardless of who you have in that alignment. Now, they're, it, it's a Todd Bowles defense, which – Makes me worry a little bit about the Vikings offense holding up. When when Kirk struggles, it's generally when and when the team as a whole, the offense as a whole struggles. It's when teams really dial up the pressure and play tight man coverage and and keep the offense guessing. And it's also this interior of the offensive line, if you remember from last episode, that I'm highly concerned about. And on the opposite side of the ball, you've got Vita Vea, who is certainly going to make an impact in this game. Uh, he's going to be really tough to deal with on the interior. He's also flanked by some pretty solid edge rushers. Um, Shaq Barrett, a little bit past his prime for sure, but uh, you've also got Joe Tryon Shainka, who's coming into his own a little bit, year three for him, if I'm not mistaken. Um, drafted Kalijah Kansi, who's questionable for, for the game. You've also got Logan Hall out of Houston. Um, who is going into his second year, you know, so it's, it's, there's a few things they can throw at you. You got old man, William Golston there, who's, who will probably get some slap, uh, some snaps. Uh, they love to send Devin white, uh, on, on blitzes and he can be really dynamic as well. But overall, I, I do like the matchup. 
I, I think if we're able to establish the run to really any extent, uh, it, it really should open things up. Um, Ryan Neal coming over from Seattle is a, is a solid safety to go next to Antoine Winfield and pretty complimentary to him as well. You'll probably see a lot of Antoine Winfield in playing center field, essentially, which is, which is what he really excels at. And, but if we're able to establish that run game, and like I talked about last episode, if they decide that they need to creep Ryan Neal down into the box to contend with the running game, then all of a sudden you've got a one-on-one -on, -one on the boundary with Justin Jefferson. And even if that's Jamel Dean, who's a very, very good corner in this league, you know, that's Jamel Dean, you've got the best wide receiver in football, one-on-one -on -one with another person. And you like that matchup 10 times out of 10. What concerns me, again, is kind of those pressure looks that Bulls is able to dial up. Um, he really gets the guys playing hard. He's got some really interesting blitz uh, blitz packages that he can throw at you. Um, they get funky with alignments. But throughout camp, that's what this offense has practiced against. They've been practicing against the Brian Flores defense. They've seen all these creative looks and and it's not a one for one comparison they're not exactly the same coordinator they have similar tendencies though so i don't think it's going to be a uh, a schematic approach by which o'connell and kirk and garrett bradbury are thrown off it should be something they're a little bit more prepared for i think we were really smacked in the mouth by like philly in week two last year when we were so familiar with this uh the donatel defense four-man pressures, off coverage, quarters type of stuff. And uh, we, we saw another Fangio-type defense week one with uh, with Joe Barry in Green Bay. Put a hurting on him. J.J. had a huge day. Week two, yeah, you see, I think it was three picks from Kirk, at least two against Philly, um, and just kind of kept slinging. They, they, they sent the zero blitz a lot, um, but they also had just guys who could win one-on-ones, and uh, they, they played the numbers game. There was no time at all for Kirk uh, to contend with that, made a couple of rash decisions, uh, but ultimately stayed aggressive. It, it put up seven points on Philly that year, which, again, better personnel than Tampa Bay has as well. But it's that type of approach that was really difficult to contend with for this offense last year. I think it's going to be different this year. I think you're gonna be a lot more prepared for, you know, these these crazy pressure looks, um, because we we've seen those throughout camp, and practice, and uh, I I think that will really help to identify some of those things, and and really navigate the challenges of just a a come and get you defense like Todd Bowles operates. Now, he's able to do that because of guys like Jamel Dean and Carlton Davis who can stick in man coverage. Um, you've got an absolute ball hawk on the back end in, in Antoine Winfield Jr. And it's it's going to be a battle. Uh, <laughs> I'm on record as, as predicting the Vikings to win this game. Uh, Dave and I joked we might win by 50. There's a lot more to do with the way the Buccaneers' offense looks. I think the defense could give us some trouble for sure. But... Again, if it's if they have us on our back foot and if we have to play from behind at all or we're not able to count on the run game and not able to get consistent push uh, from the offensive line in the run game and, and have to get a little pass happy, I think that's when we could get into some trouble um, because that can be deep water against the Todd Bowles defense when he gets in these second and longs um, and, and third and longs. That's when he really dials it up. But again, when they're dialing up that pressure, when you see zero blit, uh, when you see a, a zero uh, blitz come, when you see these five, six man pressures, yes, that causes problems for the offensive line. It causes problems for Kirk Cousins, but it also leaves uh, the inverse of that problem for the defense on the outside, just playing the numbers game against a guy like Justin Jefferson, against a guy like Jordan Addison. These guys who can really, really separate. If you give Kirk just enough time to get that ball out, um, I mean, if he sees one-on-one -on, -one on the boundary, he sees single high, the ball's going to Jefferson. 
if if he sees that, if he sees him win on the release, the ball's going to Jefferson. So you you just need to buy him just enough time to get that ball out. Um, and as long as we don't have free runners on these blitzes or just unaccounted for bodies, then it should be at least enough time to get that ball out, give a jump ball to a Jefferson, give a jump ball to a TJ Hawkinson who might be one-on-one with a linebacker or a, or a safety who's got to cover ground from depth and uh, and eat up that space. I think you're going to have really good results. Um, but, again, you know, it's 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 tough because you know – the kind of things Bulls is going to throw at you. Um, and historically, uh, really since with Kirk Cousins under center, those things have been tough to contend with. And uh, a, a lot of that has to do with the offensive line. A lot of that has to do with uh, the preparation of Kevin O'Connell and Wes Phillips and their game plan. But again, this should be a style of defense for which they're much, much more prepared than they were last year. Um, and it's it's what they've been working on. Wink Martindale did this to us in the playoffs as well. Uh, dialed up the pressure, uh, played bracket coverage on Justin Jefferson on the outside with m- much less talent in the secondary than Tampa Bay has. I mean, it was Fabian Moreau, uh, Adoree Jackson, who is a solid corner, but Fabian Moreau was the, the other boundary corner, and uh, they were still able to dial things up that made it really difficult to, to get Jage the ball. So... The more I think about this, um, you know, I, I go back and forth, but for the most part, the worse I feel about it, <laughs> just because it, it's the it's the Vikings fan cynic in me. It's because I've seen things, I've seen so many things go wrong in so many different ways that you start fixating on those. But again, this, this should be an improved offensive unit, both in their preparation and their talent and their cooperation with each other when you think about year two with all five of the same offensive line starters. Uh, I think that's going to be huge. You've got Kirk in the second year uh, with the same play caller for the first time since he donned the purple. And those are going to be huge, huge factors. I like the matchup of this offense against the defense. I think, you know, at least about 24 points get on the board and we'll talk about why, but I think that'll be enough. So looking at this Tampa Bay offense and how the Vikes D might stack up, we just talked about the type of issues that Todd Bowles could potentially create for a guy like Kirk Cousins in an offensive line like the uh, like the offensive line we're fielding on Sunday. That's going to be uh, even even more extreme when you talk about what Brian Flores might dial up to fluster Baker Mayfield and an offensive line that frankly compared to last year's group or the year prior or that Super Bowl group is pretty terrible. Uh, Tristan Wirfs kicking over to left with uh, the departure of Donovan Smith, who's now in KC Donovan Smith, I think nine seasons in Tampa at left tackle. Uh, but now you got Wirfs kicking over there. You got Luke Kadecki um, at right. Uh, Cody Moak is apparently questionable, um, but just a mean SOB. I, I do like Moak. I mean SOB out of uh, North Dakota State. Uh, Robert Hainsey has been okay um, since Jensen went down at before last year even started. Um but Jensen did suffer what might be a career-ending injury, uh, which is unfortunate because he's a, a Pro Bowl center. Uh, so Robert Hainsey fills in. You got Matt Feeler at left guard, who's been a fine, uh, a fine NFL starter. But you really just don't see the uh, the talent level on the offensive line that we've seen in Tampa uh, over the past couple of years. Um, Ali Marpet retired early. Um, you saw. Uh, what is his name? Go to uh, Cincinnati. Oh, I'm looking at his face in my head. You guys know who I'm talking about. Uh, the right guard go to Cincy. But um, anyway, it, it's just a thin group. And then you look at the pass catchers that, that Baker will have. And Mike Evans is sort of questionable for this game. Uh, the Bucks have voiced that they don't intend to extend Mike Evans. Um, after nine consecutive thousand yard seasons, 
he might be a, a trade candidate. And uh, I, I think we just watched a couple of teams who might be in the market for him on Thursday night. Uh, the Detroit wide receiving core and the Kansas City wide receiving core were abysmal uh, in the NFL season opener. So the the only real threat here is is Chris Godwin. I like Trey Palmer's uh, deep threat ability. You've got Russell Gage out, uh, which helps as well. Uh, so Chris Godwin's going to be the the real main focal point of this offense, especially when you consider the dearth of talent in the, the running back room. Rashad White's fine. Um, Sean Tucker's fine. I liked him coming out. Uh, we've seen Chase Edmonds and Keshawn Vaughn do some things at the NFL level, but again, you know that. I don't, I don't see them establishing the run game really at all, even with – I'm not particularly confident in the run defense of, of the Vikes, but, I mean, it, it shouldn't be a group that, that stresses us there. I think we're going to have Baker needing to throw the ball 40, 45 times to stay in this game, and that is a, is a recipe for disaster generally. Uh, it's especially and, and Baker's fine. You you we've seen him operate uh, offenses, get them to the playoffs, but those were more talented groups. Uh, that was the best O line in football in Cleveland. Uh, that the that year they made the playoffs, and he's a tough guy. He'll play through injury, but it's just he just doesn't have the talent around him to overcome a, a poor running game, and that, that was also the best running game in football. In Cleveland, they had uh, Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb. So I really, really like the matchup of the Vikings defense against Baker and the Bucks, especially as a season opener. I think it's going to be a great primer for this group. Um, it's not really going to be a litmus test. I, I think, I think they dominate the matchup, but. It'll be it'll be a way to try things out with a little bit less on the line than we'll have in week two against Philly at home against a team that's you know just turning the page into a full rebuild and you know I, I think Flores is really going to dial it up. I don't expect uh, again I don't expect the run game to get going and if we get these guys into second and third and longs, that's when you're going to really see some pretty interesting stuff happened on the defensive front. Um, I think you'll see a ton of disguise. I think you'll see, you know, really, really ag- aggressive play. And, and that's because you're not going to feel like there's a ton of stress on these cornerbacks. You're going to feel really confident sticking Byron Murphy on Chris Godwin. You'll probably have him shadow Chris Godwin and call it a day. And then let, um, let Evans and Blackman, you know, just fill in where they need to. Evans on one boundary or the other. Uh, Murphy shadowing Godwin. He'll kind of play plenty of slots. So you might see Murphy, Murphy shadow him inside. I'm curious to see how much shadowing they do with Murphy if he just plays sides. But I think that's that would be a good way to approach this matchup is just have Murphy shadow Godwin, do our put our best on their best, see if he's able to neutralize him a little bit, and then, you know, just just let the young guys go out there and play ball against some receivers who really, I'm not going to say they don't pose a threat. Again, like I said, I like Trey Palmer. Uh, Rakeem Jarrett can can do some things out there, athletic guy. Um, but it's not going to be anything like the, the Buccaneers offense that we saw the year before last. It was a little tough to watch last year, but um, – I really, I really think you might see a defensive touchdown, multiple turnovers, a lot of three and outs, a lot of sacks, a lot of pressures. Um, you might see Baker, Baker Mayfield might run for like 40 yards. I could see him breaking loose and, and scrambling often um, and, and maybe even leading them in rushing just because we're putting so much pressure on him. Uh, I, I think the coverage will hold up pretty well and take away the first read, second read, and force him to bail early. And, you know, yeah, that might hurt us a couple of times. But I think overall it's it's going to make it really difficult on this offense to, to move the ball. So that's kind of how 
the defense matches up against the offense. With will be without Marcus Davenport. Likely, uh, he's questionable at the moment. Uh, we should get some clarity on uh, his availability. Maybe by the time you listen to this, it's Friday night now, and um, we just got the news that he was going to be questionable uh, five six hours ago. So we'll see what happens there. But again, man, I like I like the chances a lot. Uh, the Vikings should beat the shit out of the Bucks. They really, really should. I'd love to see a, a real statement game here um, where they they don't leave anything up to question. I don't want to see – I don't want to see a cl- – I, I like close games. I like football. But I don't want to see a close game on Sunday. I really don't. I'm going to be there, first of all. Um if I might try to vlog it a little bit and, and post some content to the to the channel, but I'll be there. I'll be in the building. I want a I want an overwhelming victory. I don't I don't want to see kind of what happened last year, where it seemed like regardless of the quality of opponent, it was close down the stretch, no matter what. Um, because I, I don't want to see a, a you know, a, a four-minute drive uh, or get into our four-minute offense or two-minute offense late in the game. You know, maybe maybe we're down by a couple points. Maybe maybe it, it, it was tough to move the ball throughout the game. I don't want to see us trying to come back when Todd Bowles knows we're throwing the football. That's that's the only time I think we should be worried. But again, I don't think it should be close. I think the Vikes jump out to an early lead and maintain it throughout, and then just start to grind it out. Um, this this game might be put away by halftime, especially if the defense uh, is disruptive, forces some turnovers. Um, but my my overall score prediction right now, uh, I'm, I'm going with twenty seven. To 10 uh, Vikings over the Bucks, And I'm also going to predict two or more turnovers forced by this Brian Flores defense. And that's not even just because of the, the hype train of Brian Flores that, that we've all been riding throughout the off season. Um, I don't think it's a fanciful prediction. Um, I think it's very realistic uh, more, more so due to again, the, the, the quality of this Bucks offense. Um, it's just, it's just not a great group. And I, and I think this is the perfect type of group for this Flores defense to debut against and uh, to really showcase some of the, the ex- extremely fun uh, personnel packages, the extremely fun blitz concepts. We're going to see a ton of stunts and loopers and, um, we're going to see plenty of disguise. We're going to see safety blitzes. We're going to see linebacker blitzes. Uh, we're going to see, I think we'll see plenty of those 7-0 looks that we talked about last episode and that we saw in the preseason. It's going to be just a defense that you can't you can't really read pre-snap, which is, again, the polar opposite of what we had with Donatel last year. So... And I, th- I think that's really going to fluster Baker Mayfield and this offensive line. Again, you've got Hainsey setting, uh, setting the protection calls. He's been fine. He has started NFL games. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is a group that we can really, really fluster. And I look forward to a week one Vikings win decidedly by multiple scores where – we're not biting our fingernails in the fourth quarter, which was what 13 of the 17 games last year. Um, I think it'll be a nice reprieve from what we got used to last year. And I don't think we'll need a comeback from Kirk, the comeback kid. So you heard it here first on bite size Vikes. Um, let's see how the game goes. Uh, we will talk again. Uh, after the game, I'll be recording that 
uh, that game review on Tuesday night, right after Necessary Roughness, which will be live on the channel uh, at 8 Central every Tuesday on Bite Size Sports. Uh, we've also got another damn fantasy podcast on Wednesday nights to get you up on, you know, who to start, who to sit. Uh, Trevor Steinbacher runs that and, and does a great job. He's much more into the fantasy world than a guy like me um, and, and has a lot of great advice there. So check that out. If you like basketball, we got the bounce on Thursday night on the channel. Um, you also got the Rumbles of Red on, I think it's every other Friday night that Trevor does that. Um, but but similar thing, does dynasty uh, type of fantasy stuff. Uh, so if that's your thing, look no further. Um, additionally, again, check out the rest of our team specific podcast. We should have a couple more game previews dropping shortly on the channel. Likely by the time you're listening to this or watching this, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, drop a like subscribe. We're pushing for 750 subscribers by the end of the season. Um, and we will be dropping these episodes twice a week in addition to all of our live content on the channel. So stick around. Thanks for listening again. I'm your host, John Boyd. We'll be back. Uh, You'll have another episode uh, on your feed on Spotify or YouTube by Wednesday. And Skull Vikes, let's beat the Bucks.